We welcome you to another show presented to you by the Synapse. With us today, we have Dr. Tonio Piscopo, consultant specialist in infectious diseases. We welcome you, doctor. Thank you for Thank accepting you. our invitation to be here today. We will be speaking about HIV management. HIV infection has been with us, has been known to medicine for more than 30 years now. What can you comment about the developments throughout these past decades? Okay. Maybe first it's important to understand the evolution or the natural history of HIV without any treatment. So um, uh, as soon as a person is infected, the virus enters the body and starts replicating. Now, the uh, replication of the virus involves uh, entering CD4 cells, replicating inside that CD4 cells, and then the CD4 cells get destroyed. So, uh, initially, there is a rapid rise of the viral load and decline in CD4 cells. CD4 cells are those cells which are the defense mechanisms of the body. Um, uh, Along the months and years, then uh, a kind of equilibrium occurs between the viral load and the CD4 cells. And the person might not know at all that he is infected. So he can pass on the virus to other people, but will be asymptomatic. Along the time, uh, the CD4 cells will decline and that's when trouble starts. The person starts getting a lot of infections, which normally they one wouldn't get, and then that is when one of these infections might be fatal. So that's the natural history. Now, uh, with treatment, that has changed dramatically. So since the past 20 years or so, we've had uh, new treatments coming along, new antiviral agents. So if we were to look at the three-year prediction, for example, of someone developing AIDS, before treatment, uh, someone with a very low CD4 count and a very high viral load, so let's say a CD4 count around 200 or less, and a, CD4, and a viral load of above 55,000, mm -hmm. uh, one would have an 80% chance of developing AIDS within uh, three years, and maybe even dying. But with the advent of treatment, uh, the studies have shown that that has gone down dramatically. Now, these studies I'm quoting, and which can be seen in the, in the slides, are uh, from about 10 years ago. So that has now improved even mm -hmm. further. So what has happened over the past few years is that the prognosis of people with HIV has improved dramatically. So whereas before, someone with HIV AIDS, we had really nothing to offer, treatment has come along over the past 20 years in which we can we started to offer something 20 years ago, and that has developed quite um, well over the past years, and the prognosis has improved greatly. Then again, one of more, your main roles is also to prevent such, such, a, such an infection from occurring. Who is most at risk, and who should be screened? Okay, so basically, um, HIV gets transmitted uh, via blood or via sexual practices unsafe sexual practices. Okay, so, so people who would be most at risk, risk would be men who have sex with men, that's one of the main risk factors, or else people who have unprotected sex uh, with uh, uh, multiple partners. And uh, so these are the people who should think about getting screened regularly if they uh, do not uh, practice safer sex. Okay. And then there is another section uh, where they, you can get, obviously, blood-borne uh, transmission. And these are mainly the injection IV drug users. And these also should get screened regularly, especially if they do not use, uh, obviously, something which they shouldn't do, but, but they should use always uh, new needles. Yes. But if they don't, then they should obviously get, get screened. There are areas in the world where there, there is a higher incidence of HIV and uh, immigrants from these areas should also get, get screened. And we also screen all pregnant women um, unless they explicitly refuse to be tested for HIV. We screen them for HIV and other bloodborne viruses to make sure that uh, we, uh, if there is an infection, it does not get transmitted to the baby. 
You gave us an overview of the treatment and how it's changing dramatically the prognosis. What treatment options are available right now and when do you start treatment and so on? Yes, um, uh, if we were to, to, to look at, the, at, at this um, graphic, we, we will find that treatment has evolved uh, greatly over the, over the years. Um, uh, whereas before in uh, 19, for example, 1996, we had other uh, tre early treatments which were quite quite toxic and not as potent. We, we speak of potency when we speak of um, treatment of HIV. Okay? Um, uh, and one or two treatments. Now we have to speak of three different agents uh, which are given together and mostly to, to prevent development of uh, uh, resistance. Because the virus, like other organisms, mm -hmm. can develop resistance to antivirals. So nowadays the, the um, uh, emphasis is on developing newer treatments which are more potent but less toxic. Obviously every treatment has its side so, effects exactly. and uh, uh, different people can develop different side effects. So um, uh, the onus is on developing simpler treatments uh, and one in, in which people can tolerate better so that they can take it because this is treatment which has to be taken regularly and indefinitely. Okay. It's not something which you can cure. So this is important that HIV currently is not a curable disease. It's a controllable disease but not curable. Um, uh, now, we are starting treatment earlier on and if we were to look at the uh, Previously, we used to reserve treatments because they were a bit more toxic to patients presenting with lower CD4 counts. Now we are treating patients because there is evidence of benefit with higher CD4 counts. So the pendulum has shifted towards even earlier. treating mm -hmm. even, even earlier. What we do is monitor people who are on treatment uh, because we want them to have undetectable viral loads. So persons who are doing well on treatment will have zero or near to zero, as near to zero viral loads as possible. I want to make it clear though that does not mean that they are clear of infection. Okay? The important thing is that they are adherent, adherent to treatment. And uh, studies have shown, and uh, we have done such studies as well locally, that uh, people who adhere, meaning they are compliant to treatment well, do not develop resistance, and their uh, outcomes are better. Their CD4 rises are, are more efficient um, and better than those where there is no adherence or little less than ideal when, adherence. When are you speaking about adherence, what do you mean? As in they have to take the, the yes, when, medication when every day at the same time? We, we actually have rigid. a presentation. Uh -huh. We have a PowerPoint presentation. So every patient who started on treatment gets a PowerPoint presentation to realize the importance of sticking to treatment in terms of every day. Um, ideally once per day, but sometimes twice per day. So. So t most treatments are on a twice daily basis, but there are also instances when there are, they are better, obviously, because once a day is better than twice a day. Um, uh, but they have to stick to it nearly, nearly to the hour. We are speaking about the role of treatment in patients uh, who are already infected. But what is the role of treatment in patients who want to prevent this as a preventative measure? Okay, so in normal persons, because they would not qualify as, as patients, um, people who are, first of all, exposed to the virus can get treatment. Now, that can mean either sexual exposure or as sometimes even in our profession you can get exposed because at risk. You, you, we as doctors are at risk and people who, for example, draw blood from patients who are positive are at risk of getting needle stick injuries. So for that there is a, a, um, a, an assessment uh, and there is a post-exposure prophylaxis. So when the, person, the, the incident is deemed at risk, then uh, one can get post-exposure prophylaxis, meaning they have to take these antiviral agents for uh, uh, around four weeks um, so that they prevent replication of the virus if it had, it had the opportunity to get into the, 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 the bloodstream. And that also accounts for, for people who are exposed sexually. So the unsafe sex 
we mentioned earlier, um, uh, people who think they might be exposed might need to uh, go to their doctor or to, in this case, I think it would be a specialist to assess the need and then they would get this post-exposure prophylaxis. There is another, uh, another um, mode called now pre-exposure prophylaxis for those people who are uh, continuously at risk. And although this is not obviously recommended, but people who practice unsafe sex with multiple partners, um, and sometimes uh, men who have sex with men, uh, and they uh, either do not use protection, or as even if they use protection, they would like to be better protected, they can take continuous, not ad hoc, this is not something which you take on and off, it's something which you have to take continuously to be effective. Uh, and instead of two a three agents, it would be two agents continuously. So that's protecting these people who are exposing themselves um, in this way. Uh, the third way in which we protect persons would be mother to baby. So a mother who is HIV positive um, and who either we know about before pregnancy or we get to know during pregnancy, then we are in a position to treat the mother during pregnancy so that the child, the baby, does not get HIV during the pregnancy or during delivery. To, to prevent vertical transmission. To prevent what we call vertical okay. transmission from the mother to the baby. So those are three instances where you can uh, prevent um, transmission of the virus. Obviously, we are talking about treatment. We are not talking about prevention in terms of preventing without using treatment. Obviously, there are safer sex practices, which we already spoke about, and also uh, use of uh, uh, needles, new needles, rather than uh, used needles. We are speaking about the crux of the matter here is the developments in the management of HIV and the management of AIDS. So in the end, these, these uh, patients are living longer. And living longer means also that they may acquire more comorbidities. How does that tally with the fact that they are already infected with HIV? Okay, so since the past few years now, we, were, we are talking about aging, aging with HIV. So people are living nearly normal lives with HIV. And HIV has become almost like a, a chronic disease, you know, like people who have other chronic diseases. Uh, for example, if you compare with diabetes, something in which you have to take treatment on a regular basis to prevent complications. And HIV is something which is on a similar level. The, the other bit of the jigsaw is that HIV can be transmitted and uh, you know, other non-transmissible diseases, chronic diseases cannot be. But so, so these patients now are in a, in a situation where they are developing comorbidities like you know, uh, diabetes, like um, hyperlipidemia, like uh, ischemic heart disease, uh, medical conditions which other people can get as well. And so, you know, um, we are addressing these issues as well in pe people with HIV. What has happened along the years is that uh, if we see the mortality figures, the mortality from HIV and related causes has decreased quite, quite significantly. Um, there are certain comorbidities which have increased, like liver-associated problems, and that's partially because um, of even of the treatment itself, but in general, the uh, mortality figures have improved greatly. And if you were to see the life expectancy uh, uh, of, of patients with HIV AIDS uh, over the past few years, again, it has increased dramatically. And people now are expected to live beyond, beyond the, the you know, 60, 60 years and above when you compare with people with, with, without HIV. So life expectancy is, is uh, very, very good. Okay, um, uh, to conclude, I think um, if, if we look at a bit of statistics, it, it can, it can put, put us into the picture of what's happening world, worldwide. Um, uh, since the start of the epidemic, we've had more than 39 million deaths globally. So that's quite a significant amount, amount of people. Uh, our 2010-13 figures show that about 35 million are living with HIV AIDS in the whole, in the whole world. Uh, and we are getting about 2.1 2 million new infections per year. 
and uh, that incidence is plateauing whereas before it was the rising. slope was rising now it's plateauing and the reason for that is that because there are more people who are on antiretroviral therapy antiretroviral therapy is the treatment for for hiv the great bulk of these people are in sub-saharan africa so in in, in low to middle income countries um, and it's calculated that about 36 percent of globally of people especially in these low to middle income countries are on on treatment so that has uh, made a big impact however uh, there are there have been targets set by UNAIDS for 2030 and these targets revolve around 90 percent of those who are positive to be made aware of their diagnosis so increasing screening uh, and this is important because before um, there was a, a, a big onus on counseling and, and, and less on screening. So, so there is a lot of you know, fear of testing. Now, that obviously was in an era when you could not do much about HIV. Exactly. But in the era where you can do something, there is this uh, added benefit of knowing, treating and preventing the cycle of transmission. Okay? So the targets are 90% of people who are HIV positive know, are aware of the diagnosis, 90% of those being treated rather than the current 36% mm -hmm. and 90% of those being treated have an undetectable viral load. Because when you have an undetectable viral load, it means that you are being well, controlled, you don't have resistant virus, your CD4 count, your CD4 cells are at their highest possible and you will not develop complications. So that's the ideal situation and those are the, the targets which we hope we will help to meet. Thank you, Dr. Piscopo, for your time. We hope that this video also helped us guide the health professionals here in Malta to meet these targets here locally as well. Um, we invite you to keep on following the signups for more informative videos. Thank you for your time.